Good to fellowship with each other. I'm glad to have each one of you here this morning, especially our visitors. And if you're a visitor, if you don't mind taking a card in the pew in front of you and filling that out and putting in the collection plate as our ushers come by this morning. We appreciate it. Glad to see the sun out there this morning, too, because we probably won't see much more of it this week, and hopefully none of us will get flooded out with all the rain that's coming. Uh, So anyway, uh, a couple of uh, announcements that are not in the bulletin. Uh, Faye Nyland is going to have surgery, back surgery on Friday at St. Vincent's. So let's remember her in our prayers. Also, Regina Champion has uh, two grandsons that are going to have some surgery uh, this week. Mason Golden and Owen Golden. I think Golden is going to have tubes in his ears, and that's going to happen this week as well. Uh, I have a card to read. Dear Oxford Church of Christ, we would like to thank all of you for your prayers, cards, food, and and messages during Marty's recent neck surgery. We would also like to thank everyone for their ongoing prayers for our mom as we try to continue to care for her. We appreciate and love every one of you. This is from Marty Robin, Chelsea, and Jamerson Hills, and, and Sarah Jones. So we need to remember that, her in our prayers as well. After this morning's service, uh, after we have a few moments to set things up, there's going to be the uh, uh, Valentine's Banquet for those that are 55 and older. So don't forget to, to attend that if you've signed up for it. Uh, there's, some new vi- there's some new visitor car- visit that Let me start that over again. At the end of the table, there's some cards uh, that Leslie has put out in the auditorium the, in the greeting racks. If you'd like to... For Leslie to mail those, once you fill those out, you can just drop those off in the box and should, should be back, uh, I think, tomorrow. I don't have any other additional announcements at this time. If you have any, please give those to me. Uh, the order of our service this morning, uh, T.J. Skelton is going to have our opening prayer. Clay Blackwell will be leading us in, as a song leader. Mike Benson, our regular evangelist, will be speaking. And at the close of the service, uh, Charles Trotter will give us a closing prayer. And if, Charles, you don't mind, uh, thank them for the food uh, at the end of the service as well. This time I'll ask uh, TJ to come forward. Pray with me, please. Our Holy Father in heaven, we humbly adore and worship you. Your name is holy. Your word is holy. Your church is holy. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit and for Jesus, your precious son. We thank you for the Bible and for all who are your children, the body of Christ. We thank you for blessing us and answering our prayers. We thank you and love you because you first loved us. And for your marvelous grace, your infinite power, you have shown through Jesus and your wisdom you have made known by the church We surrender all to Jesus and seek your righteousness and to please you in our worship, in our service, in our lives, and our families, in our work, for your kingdom as a congregation, and by other works that we support, and also in our individual careers. We pray for any and all in need of deliverance or blessing And remember some we know and love, those in the bulletin, those mentioned this morning. We pray our worship is pleasing and attentive, expedient for knowledge, spiritual growth, and godliness. In Christ's lovely name, Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Number 85, 85. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. Let us sing. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me a home a house not made with hands most wonderful to see i know i know that my redeemer lives i know i know eternal life he gives i know i know that my redeemer lives our next song will be our supplemental songbook number 22 22 our supplemental <clears throat> let us sing Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer. song will be number 144 144 we'll sing all three stanzas this morning to pray to prepare our minds for the lord's supper let us sing more love to thee O christ more love to thee
unto thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry, my heart communion mean to you? When we think of the word communion, we might possibly think about when we were children and we would hear our parents or other adults say, it's our month to do communion at the church. At a young age, we knew that meant going to the church building and preparing the bread and the fruit of the vine for the Lord's Supper. As we got older, we realized that the word communion meant so much more. The word itself means a close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the Bible reads, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? As a young adult many years ago, I was sitting in a Bible class and the teacher asked the question, what does communion mean to you? An older gentleman raised his hand and said, it's my personal time to examine my Christian life and to examine my personal relationship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He went on to say, it gives me chills to know that Jesus loved it continues to love me that he went through all the pain and suffering on the cross and he died for me. As we're about to partake in the Lord's Supper, we need to ask the question, what does communion mean to you? And I personally need to ask the question, what does communion mean to me? Let us pray and give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this bread that represents Jesus' body on the cross. And Father, as we partake of it, we ask that we will do so in a manner that would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's again pray and give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we also thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood on the cross. And Father, we ask that you help us to put away all worldly things, that we will partake of the cup in a manner well-pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Another item of worship is giving. Let's pray and give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us, both physically and spiritually, each day. And Father, as we give back a portion unto you, we ask that you help us, Father, to be a loving and caring church. And Father, help us to give with humble hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand and we'll sing number 286, 286 before our lesson this morning. 
Let us sing. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, nearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He, the great example, is a pattern for me. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. List to his loving words, come unto me. Weary, heavy laden, there is sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior, and thy soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. You may be seated. If you'd like to mark in your song books number 226, 226 will be our song of invitation. Good morning. Good to see so many people out today on this lovely Lord's Day. Glad that you could be with us. Fort Sill, S-I-L-L, Fort Sill in Lawton, Oklahoma. Between 1958 and 1960, it is where soldiers in the United States go to be trained in field artillery. It is the place in the world to be trained in field artillery. Officers at the training school during that time frame complained that the majority of the students in the school would fall asleep during training. Couldn't keep them awake. They didn't pay attention. They nodded off. Five years later, in 1965, in the next training class from 65 to 67, the soldiers would listen to the lectures with rapt attention. They paid close to what the instructors were saying, and they took copious notes. What was the difference other than five years? Well, the difference was is that the second graduating class knew that in three months they would be in Vietnam fighting the Vietnamese. Here's my mustard seed. It pays to watch, to pay attention. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to our theme passage for 2020. Our shepherds sit down, and they prayed about it, talked about it, and came to the conclusion that this is where they wanted us to focus our attention, and they've asked me on a monthly basis to emphasize this theme. This morning, if you've not already done so, I would encourage you in our second lesson in this monthly series to go ahead in your Bible and underscore it now. You'll notice the apostle said, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. He employs four different military imagery words to communicate our role and responsibility. Now, let me just make a couple of sidebar observations here. Do you remember, for example, when you left home to go to college? Or when you left to go in to begin your own family and your own pursuits, and you remember perhaps that occasional letter that you would get from home, perhaps your mother or your father, and what did they say at the conclusion of the letter? I love you, be safe, be careful, 
be wise? Well, here is the Apostle Paul in chapter 16, near the end of this timely epistle. And he's concluding with those farewell remarks until he writes them again. And this is exactly what he's doing in those, in those last words to God's people. Now, I want you to keep in mind, you know, the last time that we were together on Sunday morning, we mentioned at least in the last part of the sermon, we, we looked at, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we talked about the need in the godly relationship for affection and intimacy. Has it ever occurred to you that when they received those letters in the first century, they would read them in their totality before the congregation? Well, that's what they're doing now. They have received this lengthy epistle, and Paul has addressed all of the issues, and we're going to talk about a few of those as we have time. And then he concludes with this idea, and the, this is the one that we want to emphasize today. I'm not going to look at the whole verse. I'm going to look at one piece of imagery, and that is the idea of watching, because that's our theme. There are two things that we want to accomplish this morning in our study, as time will permit. Number one, we want to talk about the definition, as well as the duty of watching, and then as we have time, we'll talk about the delegates that God has selected to do the watching in our homes and in the body of Christ. Number one, let's talk about the definition and the duty of watching. Now, if your Bible is still open to that particular passage, there in the margin of your Bible, if you're so inclined, you want to write this word or this phrase, I should say. It means to give strict attention to. When he says watch, he is saying be vigilant. Now, you'll notice here in the PowerPoint that I use this phrase. It's in the present tense. Someone says, Mike, I've never studied Greek, don't have an intention of studying Greek. When you hear a preacher, a gospel preacher, reference the present tense, present tense always communicates this idea. Listen, continuous action. So when you hear present tense, he's saying, I want you to watch, I want you to give strict attention to, I want you to always be vigilant. You don't ever stop watching, Paul says. It describes the guard, uh, the role rather, of a sentinel or of a guard. Sentinels and guards would serve, as I've been able to read in the scriptures, in at least four different capacities. Number one, they would, a sentinel would be at the top of a city wall, and they would be watching. We'll give an example of that in a minute from Second Samuel. Or of a tower, for example, if you owned a vineyard, they would be in a tower, and at harvest time, why would those guards or sentinels be there? Because there would be thieves that would want to come and steal the crop. And so the tower would be there to be able to watch over the vineyard and to see that no one would take it away. Or they would guard, for example, at the tomb of Jesus. Remember how that the Pharisees came to Pilate and they said, uh, you know, we remember how this deceiver said that after three days he'd be resurrected and the disciples might want to come and steal the body under the guise of it actually being resurrected. And so Pilate says, all right, put a guard there, Roman guards. Or a sentinel or a guard would stay at a jail, for example, when Peter was placed in prison in the book of Acts. Let's look at an example of a sentinel and go with me in 2 Samuel. If you have the opportunity this afternoon, and I'm sure you will, but I want to encourage you personally to study this or at least read this and mull it over in your private devotional, if not this afternoon, sometime this week. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, let me give you an abbreviated Reader's Digest of what's happening here so that I just don't rinse these verses out of their context. David's brought some terrible problems on his life. He saw a woman. He lusted after her. He took her. He killed her husband. And there were consequences for that. 
His family would be divided at times even against him. He had a son by the name of Amnon. Amnon saw one of his sisters, are you listening? Tamar was his name, and Amnon took her, raped her. Absalom is a half-brother of Amnon, and Absalom says, now, I'm putting it in Mike Benson lingo here, here's what Absalom says, Daddy, aren't you going to do something about this? Aren't you going to intervene? Because my half-brother has raped my sister. Now, the reason that David couldn't do that is because David has been guilty of illicit activity himself. And so Absalom takes it upon himself, and he has Amnon killed. He has him assassinated. And Amnon, I'm sorry, Absalom, rather, now that he has his, his half-brother killed, Absalom gets to thinking, you know what, Daddy's not a very good judge. And he starts to steal the hearts of the people away from Israel. You know, if I were a judge, I'd be better than Dad is. And he actually not only steals the, the hearts of the people away, but he actually gets several thousand in his army. And inevitably what happens is, is Absalom's army has to fight David's army. And this is where we are in the picture. David flee, had to flee for his life, and now he's come to a particular city. And we're in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And I want you to notice what's happening here because we're talking about sentinels. I wanted to give you at least a, a, an abbreviated context here so you'd know what was happening. Verse 24, David was sitting between the two gates of the city, and the watchman, cross-reference that, went up to the roof over the gate to the wall, lifted up his eyes and looked, and there was a man running alone. Now what's happened is, is if you remember your Bible history, is that Absalom is being, and, and his army is being annihilated, and he has this long hair, and he's riding a mule, and his hair gets caught in a tree, and he's literally suspended between heaven and earth. Joab, one of the generals in the army, sees him and pierces him through with darts in his heart. See, David had said, be gentle, don't harm my son. Joab is a pragmatist, and you know, even though David's the king, Joab knows that this guy's been, a, your son has been a threat to your kingdom, and so he kills him. And so David is here in the city, and the watchman goes up on the top, and he sees somebody running toward him. Now watch what happens, verse 25. Verse 24, the watchman went up to the roof over the gate, to the wall, lifted up his eyes, looked, and there was a man running. Then the watchman, watch it, he cried out. He's way up here in the wall, and he's crying down to David, and he says, he told the king, and the king said, if he's alone, there is news in his mouth. He is essentially the Old Testament postman. He's going to come tell us about what's happened there on the battlefield, and he's anxious to hear that his son is still living. And he came rapidly and he drew near. Verse 26, then the watchman saw another man running and the watchman called to the gatekeeper. What's he doing? He is high and he's elevated. He can see farther than someone else. Now, some of you in the assembly, deer hunters, know that you'll climb a tree. Why do you do that? Number one, to get out of the visual acuity of, of a deer. You want to get high and above him so you can see. Well, that's what's happening here. He is crying out so that David and the gatekeeper can hear. He sees two different men, and watch what he does. There is another man running alone, and the king said he also brings news. Verse 27, that's David, by the way. So the watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of, Ahim um, of Ahimaaz. He can not only tell the king the, uh, that two men are running, but he can actually identify one of them by the way, the gait, and the look of the run. He is a guard. He is a sentinel. Now, I like the, the Andy Griffith show. I don't like the color version. I like the black and white versions. And I did a little historical study Monday night on campus when I was in the school library. 
and I discovered this guy, Asa Brainy was his name, on the Andy Griffith Show. He was actually a clerk at the Mayberry Hotel, but he was a security guard. He was a central at Mayberry Security Bank, and he served at Weaver Store. And you remember when you saw him, what was he doing? He was sleeping, and the bank was broken into, and Weaver Store was broken into. Well, watch the idea. The Apostle Paul says what? He says, you're to watch, you're to be vigilant, you're to pay close attention, you're to cry out what you see, you're to be able to to pay very close attention to what's happening in people's lives as well as your own. Now go with me to look at another example in your Old Testament to Ezekiel chapter 3. One of the major prophets, Ezekiel chapter 3. Begin reading with me at verse 16. In fact, the New King James has here, Ezekiel is a watchman. It came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord, watch it, God spoke to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, he's speaking to Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman. Well, we have an example from 2 Samuel 18 talking about God's people. And he is a spiritual watchman for these people. For the house of Israel, therefore hear the word of the Lord from my mouth and give them warning from me. See, sometimes the watchman would be in the city walls and he'd say, well, no, there's a runner. Well, there's two runners there. And sometimes he would say, you know what? I see an entire army coming this way and we need to be ready. Verse 18, when I say to the wicked, Ezekiel's job is to repeat that. You shall surely die, and you give them or him no warning. In other words, you see judgment coming. You don't say anything, watch it, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man, he'll die in his iniquity. He's still going to die whether you say it or not, but his blood I will require at your hand. See, if you don't warn the wicked man, he's still going to die, but you're going to be held accountable. Verse 19, yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from the wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity either way, but you have delivered your soul. It's the role of the watchman to warn. If he doesn't warn, the man will die and you'll die because you've not fulfilled your responsibility. Now here's the context. We're not going to take the time to go back to Jeremiah chapter 29. I'll just give you those passages and let you write them in the margin of your Bible and study them on your own. God's people are now in Babylonian captivity. And it is Ezekiel's responsibility to tell them, you still have to watch. You still need to pay attention. You've suffered the consequences for your idolatry and for your rebellion. And you need to be careful about what you hear. Because there would be those in captivity who would say, you know what? We're just going to be here a short time and and God's going to release us and we're going to go back. No, we're going to be here about um, 70 years. You need to watch is his point. I'm a World War II history buff. You may not know the name of Kermit Tyler, but he had just been appointed on December the 5th to be in charge of the radar installation in Hawaii. He had not been given any training. He had not been given any staff. He was simply moved from one job to the next in the military there 
in Honolulu. And you say, well, okay, that's not unusual. A lot of times they would train people on the job. Well, he got a call from a radar man that said there is a large, huge radar blip saying that planes are coming this way. And here's what he said. Don't worry about it. Four words. Because he knew that there was a flight of B-17 bombers that were going to be coming back to the United States. Guess what? It wasn't B-17 bombers. It was the Japanese. And you know, December the 7th, 1941, he was to be a watchman. He died at at age 96, and historians went back to Mr. Tyler, and they talked about that particular day and and the ramifications of the fact that the watchman didn't watch, and he didn't communicate the warning, and he said, I would often wake up in the middle of the night, and I was haunted, he said, with nightmares because I wasn't as vigilant as I should have been. And that brings us to our second point. Let's talk about the delegates who are called in Scripture to watch. Now, I want you to go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if you will. And I can hear what a few people are thinking. There are some who are saying to themselves, well, you know, I know eventually going to be talking to elders. And the answer is, Yes, but I want you to notice something here. Remember, he is writing this letter that has been written to the congregation at large. And in fact, we often quote 1 Corinthians 16 and we invoke it in the context of the contribution here in the first part of the verses. But beginning at verse 5 and then down at verse 13, He's giving his final exhortations, as mama or daddy would do as we go off. And contextually, he's talking to us, to the church at large. Now I want you to think about the implications of that. If you've studied 1 Corinthians, and I know most of you have because I've taught it here, you think about, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, there's division in the Lord's church between one member and another. I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. In chapters 2 and 3 and 4, there's problems of pride and attitudes that need to be corrected. In chapter 5, there's a man who's having an illicit relationship With his father's wife, there is immorality in the church. In chapter 6, they're actually going to law against one another. They're taking each other to court. In chapter 7, there are marital problems, as we talked about last Lord's Day morning. In chapters 8 and chapters 10, there's the problem of idolatry that is invaded in the church. In chapter 11, there's the problem of a woman and her veil and the Lord's Supper and whether or not we get our minds correctly thinking the right thing about the Lord's Supper. In chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, he talks about miraculous spiritual gifts. In chapter 15, he talks about the resurrection from the dead. Now watch it. This is a church with all kinds of problems. And he comes to them and he says, you individually as members of the body of Christ have got a lot of watching to do. You'd be very diligent to look at your own life. Now I want to make this observation and I'm going to ask you to, I know if your Bible is still open to 1 Corinthians 13, back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm making a point here in the PowerPoint that I'm going to substantiate with Scripture. You're going to say, well, they're apostate. I mean, they've they've just totally lost and left the faith. No, they haven't. They could get there. They're headed in that direction. But watch what he says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, to the church of God. Who's he writing to? Us, to the church we need to be very careful 
We need to be watching. Well, Mike, what are some things that we need to be watching for? Well, on a, on a very real level, number one, anything that would hinder us or distract us from our faith. So I saw a lady not too long ago. She said, I'm signing off of Facebook. I said, we'll miss you. I asked her, why are you going to do that? She said, I spend too much time here. Wow. Anything that would distract me, anything. Can I ask you a question? How much time do we spend on our phones as opposed to private and personal devotion and study? See, anything, I'm not saying that we don't get on our phone. I'm saying anything that distracts me, anything that hinders me in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul says, watch, be a sentinel, be on guard for anything that might pull you away from Christ. Peter said, be sober, watch it, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Do you know any Christians at the Oxford Church of Christ who have fallen away? You know how they fell away? They weren't watching. They said, ah, you know what? The Bible's not relevant. Everybody else is doing this. You know, and what happened? Spiritually speaking. The devil ate him alive. And if it could happen to our loved ones, it could happen to us. Paul said, watch. Now go with me to your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, he's dealing with two issues. Number one, the destruction of Jerusalem, which ultimately occurs in AD 70, but he also deals with the second coming. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Some of you know this. It was Father's Day two years ago. It was a Chinese buffet here in Anniston. And Daddy, that was his favorite place to eat at the time when it was opened. And so I said, where do you want to go? He said, I want to go eat Chinese buffet. And we went to Anniston. I thought... I thought I had locked the door of the truck, and I had hit it twice and unlocked it. We went in to eat. I came out after dinner was over. We got in the truck and started to drive away, and I thought, why is this here, and why is this here? Wait a minute. What? And I pulled off to the side of the road, and I pulled up the little box between the seat where I kept my 9 millimeter, and it was gone. You know what had happened? Somebody had walked up and had stolen that pistol. Now, if I had known that lady was going to do that, and by the way, I found out who it was, but if I had known that she was going to do that, you know what? I would have been more vigilant. And Jesus says, we cannot live in such a way and say, you know what? He's not coming today, and so I can live however I want to live because he might come today. Paul says, listen, church, don't forget, be watching because Jesus could come at any time. And he's not going to give any precursor, as denominationalists would tell us. We are to watch. Number two, go with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Who else is to watch? In Hebrews chapter 13, in the writer here, concluding his remarks, talks to those men and that responsibility. In Hebrews 13, in verse 17, I want you to notice here, Obey those who rule over you. They can't set arbitrarily, arbitrary rules outside the dictates of Scripture. But in matters of expediency, they determine, for example, that I'm going to preach this series of lessons. They have the authority to determine what time we come together, Bible study and worship, and on Sunday afternoons. He said, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, watch this, for 
They W-A-T-C-H for your souls as those who must give an account. Like the watchmen of, e uh, of Ezekiel chapter 3, they'll stand before the final judgment and every member of the Oxford Church, they'll give an account for them. Number one, they have to be, therefore, since they're watching, they have to watch out for false teachers. Now, if I'm going to be conscious of false teachers, I have to know what false teachers teach, right? And so I want to know what they're teaching. That inherently means that our shepherds are to be readers and teachers themselves. Number two, they're to be watching not only a false doctrine but a false practice when a brother starts to fall away brethren if any man is overtaken in a trespass you who are spiritual well who is spiritual the elders you who are spiritual restore such one in a spirit of gentleness the word restoration here has to do with the repairing of a broken bone one of the shepherds might say, an individual will say, well, wait, it's not going to do any good. I mean, look how they've lived. They've, they, they've, just, they've just fallen off. They're not going to listen. But now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does Ezekiel say? Ezekiel says, if you don't warn them, they're still going to perish, but then your blood, you'll be held accountable for them. And so they have the awesome incredible responsibility we talk about the role and the responsibility of the president in the united states to protect his nation these men will stand before almighty god and give an account for every single soul in this congregation in acts chapter 20 paul says therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock now here's how i've looked at that passage therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock and i say well they're to watch the flock yes but before they watch the flock they must first watch themselves they have to first shepherd themselves when they struggle when they have problems See, they put their britches on one leg at a time like everybody else. Who else is to be watching? Well, so am I. I'm going to ask you to go here quickly to 1 Timothy and to 2 Timothy in your Bible. And every time you see in 1 Timothy the word doctrine, you underscore it in your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to hurry. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some, watch it, that they may teach no other doctrine. Who's he talking to? A preacher. Chapter 4 to verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, watch it, and doctrines of deeming, demons, false teaching. Verse 6 of chapter 4, if you instruct the brethren in these things, well, what things? Doctrines. You'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine, verse 6, which you have carefully followed. Verse 7, reject profane um, old wives' fables and exercise yourself rather to godliness. Chapter 4 to verse 11, these things, well, what things are that? Is doctrine. Verse 13, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Chapter 15, meditate on these things. Well, what things, Paul? Doctrine. Verse 16, take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. Continue in them. Chapter 5, at verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. Chapter 6, at verse 1, he speaks of in his doctrine. Chapter 6, and verse 3, and to the doctrine which is according to doc uh, godliness. It's a gospel preacher's responsibility to teach doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, to guard. That's my role, and that's my responsibility. So sometimes when we 
talk about, well, I, 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 I didn't particularly enjoy that particular lesson. Well, sometimes I don't either. But I have that responsibility to be as a watchman. And Paul says we are to watch and to watch ourselves. In fact, I want you to notice chapter 1 and verse 18. This I charge and I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made. Listen concerning you that you may wage the good warfare, having the faith and a good conscience. Yeah, we're to watch. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, we're to be sentinels. We're to be aware. We're to be vigilant in our own lives. I'm going to ask you to do something. As you think about this week in the context of the Lord's Supper, have you been vigilant in your life? Have you been watching for every individual soul? Have you been watching and shepherding yourselves? Have you been paying attention to the doctrine of Christ? Have you been vigilant for anything that might pull you away from Christ? Anything that might hinder you from your relationship with Jesus? See, Paul said to be sober, be vigilant. Clay's going to lead us in a song. Do you need to ask for the prayers of the church? Do you need to obey the gospel and put on Christ in baptism? If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come now while together we stand and while we sing? shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? a sad day coming, a sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his doom depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you Ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Again, I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of our visitors. We're glad you chose to come and worship with us this morning and hope you have a few minutes after our services to Hang around and give us an opportunity to introduce ourselves. We'll sing the first verse of number 152, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. And Brother Charles, don't forget to uh, bless the food for us here for our Valentine's banquet, which will be right here after our closing prayer. And then hope to see each and every one of you back at 1.30 for our afternoon services. Let us sing. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide.
right till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lovely day that we may use to assemble, enjoy the company of friends, and to study your word. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on the gathering that we will uh, soon have today. Bless the food that they will consume. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing and guidance for those among our dear brethren who are fighting illness at this time and those of our brethren who have trouble in their lives. We ask that you would watch over and be with them, restore them to health and happiness if it is your will. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed on our great nation. And we ask that you would continue to extend this blessing upon us. Help us to bring more of our people to your word. Heavenly Father, we ask your forgiveness for our sins. And we ask that you forgive us when we fall from the path that you would have us take. We ask that you would restore us to this right, if it is your will. Heavenly Father, we now ask that you would watch over and guide us until again here we meet. We ask these things and we give these thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>